Over a period of seven months in 1954 and 55, Avatar Meher Baba gave a series of messages that specifically concerned the work for his manifestation during this advent. The first of these and the most significant was the final declaration, which is undeniably one of the most important messages of Meher Baba's life mission. Yet it is often overlooked, even considered shocking to some people. To get a deeper understanding of these messages, it is important to maintain the context by giving them the attentive continuity that they deserve. That means that we must review the full messages along with relevant comments Baba gave and attempt to shed any additional light through the history and reactions of his lovers during that mystifying period. All this cannot be comfortably presented in a prescribed time. However, it is very important to contemplate these related messages as a whole. The Final Declaration at Maribad, on the morning of 30th September, 1954, Baba addressed the gathering of about a thousand men who had been invited for this special two-day occasion. This is some of what he communicated. In October at Satara, I shall be appearing to lead a retired normal life, eating, drinking, taking walks, and so on but there will be no use of the board and other things from October 7th, as I have told you. By the end of April 1955, I will definitely drop this body. During the six months, November to April, three phases of the avatar life will manifest themselves. First, a very strange and serious disease will attack this body, which will be because of my humiliation that I have been speaking about. Secondly, the humiliation will end in the sudden breaking of my silence and my uttering that word which only God can utter. Thirdly, glorification will replace humiliation. All the pent-up infinity in me will splash and spread over the universe. Calling Dr. Duncan to the dais, Baba continued dictating on the board which Don was asked to explain. Baba wants to use a simile about the atom bomb. Just as an atom bomb, which in itself is so small, when exploded, causes tremendous havoc, so when he breaks his silence, the universal spiritual upheaval that will take place will be something that no one can describe. It will happen in a second, at a time when nobody expects it. Just as when an earthquake takes place suddenly, when no one is ready and no one can do anything, but everyone in the affected area feels it, so the breaking of his silence will create a spiritual upheaval, and everyone will feel it in his heart. Then Baba continued, and unbelievable as it may seem, my universal glorification will not be manifested very near my physical presence, wherever I may be then. At the time of my glorification, all will feel it throughout the world, but those who are around me will not be affected. They who will be there will not be merely disinterested in Baba, but they will actually be hostile. For example, I may be then in Pune, with no one from the Mandali near me, but 30 or 40 of the hostile group may be there, and they will not feel this glorification and upheaval. All the rest of the world will feel it. Not one of my Mandali or lovers will be near me when I am beaten and finally stabbed. Yet I never die. I am always the Ancient One. You should all remember that God alone is real, and all else is illusion. Your attending this meeting and hearing in precise and definite terms about these happenings will be worth it if all of you, or if some of you, or at least a few of you, spread the message of my love to others. Exactly at 3 p.m. that afternoon, Baba's final declaration was read in four languages. 
by Erich in English, Dr. Deshmukh and Dake Polkar in Marathi, Keshav Nigam in Hindi, and Kutumba Sastri in Telugu. I am very happy to have you all here. I know that many of you have come to Marabad under very difficult circumstances. Some of you have covered thousands of miles and even crossed continents to be at Marabad today. It is your deep love for me that has braved all obstacles and prompted you to sacrifice your comforts and conveniences to honor my call and be near me today. I am deeply touched by your devotion and I am proud of the hearts that contain such love and loyalty. There are many more devoted hearts like yours yearning to be present here, but these are not seen in your midst today. I know that despite their intense desire to be near me, they could not possibly come for one reason or another. Therefore, they depend on you to convey to them in detail all that you see and hear during these two days of unique opportunity that has fallen to your lot. I trust you will not fail them. Although you are present here with all love and faith in me, and though you feel blessed to have my personal contact, yet I know that you will not realize today, as you ought to, the true significance of my call and your presence here at this juncture. Time alone will make most of you realize, not many months from now, the significant importance of this assembly. The time is fast approaching when all that I have repeatedly stressed from time to time will definitely come to pass. Most of you will witness these events and will recall very vividly all that transpires during these two days of your stay at Meravad. I have not come to establish anything. I have come to put life into the old. I have not come to establish retreats or ashrams. I create them for the purpose of my universal work, only to repeatedly dissolve them once that purpose has been served. The universe is my ashram and every heart is my house, but I manifest only in those hearts in which all, other than me, ceases to live. When my universal religion of love is on the verge of fading into insignificance, I come to breathe life into it and to do away with the farce of dogmas that defile it in the name of religions and stifle it with ceremonies and rituals. The present universal confusion and unrest has filled the heart of man with greater lust for power and a greed for wealth and fame, bringing in its wake untold misery, hatred, jealousy, frustration, and fear. Suffering in the world is at its height, in spite of all the striving to spread peace and prosperity to bring about lasting happiness. For man to have a glimpse of lasting happiness, he has first to realize that God, being in all, knows all, that God alone acts and reacts through all, that God, in the guise of countless animate and inanimate entities, experiences the innumerably varied phenomena of suffering and happiness. Thus, it is God who has brought suffering in human experience to its height, and God alone who will efface this illusory suffering and bring the illusory happiness to its height. Whether it manifests as creation or disappears into oneness of reality, whether it is experienced as existing and real, or is perceived to be false and non-existent, illusion throughout is illusion. There is no end to it, just as there is no end to imagination. There are two aspects experienced in illusion, manyness and oneness. While manyness multiplies manyness, oneness goes on magnifying itself. Manyness is the religion of illusion on which illusion thrives. In the illusory beginning of time, there was no such 
state of mess in illusion as there is today. When the evolution of consciousness began, there was oneness in spite of the diversity in illusion. With the growth of consciousness, manyness also went on increasing until now it is about to overlap the limit. Like the wave that reaches its crest, this height of manyness will dissolve itself and bring about the beginning of oneness in illusion. Suffering at its height will cause the destruction of this climax of manyness in illusion. The time has come for the preordained destruction of multiple separateness, which keeps man from experiencing the feeling of unity and brotherhood. This destruction, which will take place very soon, will cause three-fourths of the world to be destroyed. The remaining one-fourth will be brought together to live a life of concord and mutual understanding, thus establishing a feeling of oneness in all fellow beings, leading them toward lasting happiness. Before I break my silence, or immediately after it, three-fourths of the world will be destroyed. I shall speak soon to fulfill all that is shortly to come to pass. To affirm religious faiths, to establish societies, or to hold conferences will never bring about the feeling of unity and oneness in the life of mankind, now completely absorbed in the manyness of illusion. Unity in the midst of diversity can be made to be felt only by touching the very core of the heart. This is the work for which I have come. I have come to sow the seed of love in your hearts so that, in spite of all superficial diversity which your life in illusion must experience and endure, the feeling of oneness through love is brought about amongst all the nations, creeds, sects, and castes of the world. In order to bring this about, I am preparing to break my silence. When I break my silence, it will not be to fill your ears with spiritual lectures. I shall speak only one word, and this word will penetrate the hearts of all and make even the sinner feel that he is meant to be a saint while the saint will know that God is in the sinner as much as he is in himself. When I speak the word, I shall lay the foundation for that which is to take place during the next 700 years. When I come again after 700 years, the evolution of consciousness will have reached such an apex that materialistic tendencies will be automatically transmuted into spiritual longing and the feeling of equality in spiritual brotherhood will prevail. This means that opulence and poverty, literacy and illiteracy, jealousy and hatred, which are in evidence today in their full measure, will then be dissolved through the feelings of the oneness of all men. Prosperity and happiness will then be at their zenith. This does not mean that oneness in illusion shall remain so eternally. This is because all that is, is illusion. The consciousness of oneness, as well as manyness in illusion, is part of the process of evolution. The time is bound to recur when there will be, again, the same beginning, growth, and culmination of the heights of manyness and oneness in illusion. My next advent, after I drop this body, will be after 700 years, and that will mark the end and the beginning of a cycle of cycles. All cycles of time in illusion end and begin after 700 to 1400 years. There have been and will be millions and billions of such cycles in a cycle of cycles. Thus, there is no end to illusion, which always remains illusion. Age after age, I come amidst mankind to maintain my own creation of illusion, 
thereby also awakening humanity to become aware of it. The framework of illusion is always one and the same, but the designs in illusion are innumerable and ever-changing. My advent is not to destroy illusion because illusion, as it is, is absolutely nothing. I come to make you become aware of the nothingness of illusion. Through you, I automatically maintain illusion, which is nothing but the shadow of my infinite self. And through me, you automatically discard illusion when you are made aware of its falseness. My manifestation as the avatar of the time will be of short duration. This short period will, in quick succession, cover my humiliation, the breaking of my silence, my glorification, and my violent physical end. Everlastingly, with all the divine bliss within me, I eternally suffer for one and all. Thus, I am crucified eternally and continually for all. During this short period, my word of words will touch the hearts of all mankind, and spontaneously this divine touch will instill in man the feeling of the oneness of all fellow beings. Gradually, in the course of the next 700 years, this feeling will supersede the tendency of separateness and rule over the hearts of all, driving away hatred, jealousy, and greed that breeds suffering, and happiness will reign. The declaration was heard in perfect silence. Baba then gave prasad to each of the men and embraced them. It was not easy for Baba to make his way to the car and leave for Marazad with Erich. Many of the men were shedding tears, hoping for one last touch from him. They lined the road for quite a distance to get a glimpse or to kiss his hand. Naturally, the profound messages from this meeting had a deep effect on Meher Baba's followers around the world. The expression of his divine authority could not be denied. The announcement of destruction of three quarters of the world was sensational, but Baba declaring that he would soon drop his body was shocking. So many from Hamirpur and Andhra had only just come to know of and love Baba, and now he was telling them that he would soon be gone. In the days that followed, letters and telegrams came pouring in, expressing his lover's reactions to his final declaration. At the meeting in Sitara on October 7th, Baba had invited 20 men to participate in a prayer function as he gave up use of the alphabet board. The last message Baba dictated from the board was something very poignant. One paragraph of it reads, Oh, my lovers, I love you all. It is only because of my love for my creation that I have descended on earth. Let not your hearts be torn asunder by my declarations concerning the dropping of my body. On the contrary, accept my divine will cheerfully. You can never escape from me. Even if you try to escape from me, it is not possible to get rid of me. Therefore, have courage and be brave. On the last board he used, the paper zero was partially detached. And when Baba flung it to Sava Kotwal, three quarters of that zero fell off. Baba indicated that this was confirmation of the world destruction, which would be very beneficial for humanity spiritually. By Baba's order, Erich sent that board, including the detached portion of the zero in a little plastic pouch, to Padre for preservation at Maribad. And that is now kept safely in the archives there. During the weeks following the final declaration, the men who had attended the meeting did their part to spread Baba's message. There was quite a bit of publicity about it in India. And because of it, many more people heard about Meher Baba. Of course, those who were opposed to Baba objected to his claim of authority to make such statements. This dynamic atmosphere of thoughts and emotions continued, 
And then about 40 days later, Baba issued a clarification of his final declaration, which was distributed as another life circular. The clarification reads, it is really very difficult for anyone to believe and understand what I say because no one can grasp the meaning underlying my words. It is natural, even for my intimate mandali, not to understand my final declaration. But I want you to take everything that I said in Meharabad during the meetings very seriously, because all that I said was the truth. They were words of God, and all the things said must come to pass exactly in the manner described by me. From the day I declared in Meharabad that there will be the destruction of three-fourths of the world, that a strange disease will attack my body, that I will suffer humiliation, that I will break my silence and speak one word, the word of words, that there will be my glorification, and that finally I will drop my body when I shall be stabbed in the back. My lovers and others have been trying to interpret my words in different ways. Everyone is free to interpret my words in any way he thinks and feels. But one thing I tell you, whenever I say a thing, I naturally use my own language, and whatsoever is said by me is truth. But my language is such that no one can understand or grasp the underlying meaning of what I say. Therefore, when I want to say a thing, I have simultaneously to make use of your language also, knowing well that you would understand nothing whatsoever if I were to make use of my language alone. In order to help you to understand my final declaration and to put an end to your confusion and worry, I want all of you to know that when you saw me dictate on my alphabet board during the meetings at Marabat and heard about, one, a strange disease attacking my body, it was said in your language. Two, the humiliation that I will suffer, it was said in your language. Three, the breaking of my silence and uttering the one word of words, it was said in my own language and simultaneously in yours, because when I utter that word, it will be an audible word to you. Four, my glorification, it was said simultaneously in my language and yours. Five, the destruction of three-fourths of the world, it was said in my own language alone. Six, the stab in my back, it was said in my own language alone. Seven, the dropping of my body, it was said in my own language and simultaneously in yours. Consequently, whatever is said by me in your language, you are able to understand and know what is said. But that which is said in my own language is impossible for you to understand, however much you all may try to interpret and grasp the underlying meaning behind my words. Only the fulfillment of events can unfold to you in due course the meaning of what is said in my own language. I therefore want you all not to worry unnecessarily or to be confused. Just believe that whatever I say is truth and that all which I said in my final declaration will come to pass precisely as I have dictated by the end of April 1955. And the beginning of all that is to happen within the period of these six months will be affected by me from the 1st of December. 1954. Now what was he doing? After creating that intense emotional atmosphere with his final declaration and engaging the mental focus of his lovers on the work of his manifestation, it seemed that he was trying to explain away some of the more sensational elements of the declaration. To the cynic, it seemed that Meher Baba was just toying with the emotions of his followers, like a narcissist starving for more attention. But one of the many 
spiritually advanced persons Baba had contacted through the years. For example, two saints of the sixth plane, Vishandas Maharaj and Gadge Maharaj, had not physically attended the meeting at Maravad, yet surely they knew of Baba's declaration. In fact, during this time, they became even more devoted to Baba. Just a few days before Baba issued his clarification, he had visited the annual festival at Pandarpur, fulfilling Gadge Maharaja's wish. There, before hundreds of thousands of pilgrims, Gadge Maharaj proclaimed that the very incarnation of Vishnu in this age, Avatar Meher Baba, was standing before them. So then, what did Baba mean when he stated that something was in his own language? Was this just his way of pacifying people after getting a rise out of them? Baba's undistracted focus on the subject shows us that this was not the case. If this was not hyperbole, then it had to be a higher spiritual language that we as ordinary people cannot understand. We only hear a reflection. Since there is no language on the seventh plane, it must be a language that Avatar Meher Baba, the highest of the high, the head of the spiritual hierarchy used to communicate with those listening on the higher spiritual planes. During those months after Baba had stopped using the alphabet board, his time with the Mandali became more serious. They usually just sat in silence. There were no jokes or stories as usual during this period. He was also not responding to most correspondence. His time with the Mandali in general had become limited to 20 or 30 minutes a day. Baba did work on the supplement of God Speaks during this time, using a peculiar and very tedious system of communication. He had Bao stand and repeat the English alphabet, A, B, C, D, etc., signaling when Bao had reached the desired letter. Then Bao would begin again from the beginning. In this way, Baba would convey every word and sentence. Imagine the patient focus. In a letter from January 1955, Ramju wrote, Baba and all those who live with or near him remain more or less preoccupied with what Baba calls his preparation for breaking his silence. As far as appearances go, Baba is day by day withdrawing more and more to himself, reducing all communications to the minimum of gestures in respect to day-to-day -day routine, without recourse to the alphabet board or making signs of writing by fingers, as he used to do throughout the 30 years of his silence. Living practically with next to no sleep during the nights and subsisting on meager nourishment as an excuse for eating once every 24 hours, Baba still remains very active from morning to evening, and twice in a day walks more than a mile from one bungalow to the other. During the months following the clarification, some seem to assume a more casual attitude about Baba's final declaration. At Satara, Baba dictated a confirmation of his final declaration, which was issued as another life circular on the 3rd of February in 1955. Baba and those living with him have carried out a special program of specific activities for a period of 40 days from the 1st of December, 1954 to the 10th of January, 1955. Having completed this special phase of his work, Baba desires all concerned to know that each and all things as intimated, declared, and clarified by me are all fixed and ordained facts, and God will see that everything happens and is done as foreordained by him. All this that is desired to take place is unavoidable, yet the resultant effects can be modified in two different ways according to relative circumstances. The modification of the effects of a desired plan can, on the one hand, either affect the intensity, scope, 
and size of the chain of events, or on the other hand, bring about a considerable change in the factor of time. In either case, the effects can be modified as much in relation to me and those closely connected with me as to the world at large. For example, the world can absorb fully a simultaneous spiritual and material shock either by a modification in the quality and quantity of events or by a considerable change in the time factor. If the time limit, that is April 1955, as mentioned at the Marabad meetings, remains unchanged, then in order to enable the world to fully absorb the shock of shocks, the chain of events may be modified both in degree and in kind. But if the time limit is changed considerably, the events will take place without any modification whatsoever. In the latter case, the most important and significant point is that definitely and emphatically the link between my physical body and all external activities as carried on up to now will be dropped by April 1955, and there will take place an immeasurable change in the external relations between me and those who are closely connected with me. So that if I do not drop my physical body, I will yet, so to say, die, or I will then become actually dead to the world up to the end of the modified period of time. During the indefinite period of the modified time, I will completely stop one and all of my external activities as carried out and carried on by me in the course of the different phases of my physical life so far, including the present life of retirement among those who live with me permanently. One, I will then, throughout this modified period of time, live a life of complete physical detachment from everything and everybody, except a few things, as will be absolutely necessary for my requirements of nature in the barest sense of living the life of a man alive. Two, I wish all my lovers to observe a fast and remain only on water, which can be taken any number of times during the fast, for 24 hours from 8 p.m. on Saturday, 12th February, to 8 p.m. on Sunday, 13th February, and to devote all available time during the 24 hours in praying to God in the way each likes best to pray to him. Three, honesty is the keynote to divinity. He who can love God honestly can lose himself in God and find himself as God. The gist of the theme of the confirmation is summarized in the third paragraph. All this that is desired to take place is unavoidable, yet the resultant effects can be modified in two different ways according to relative circumstances. During the following weeks, Baba was occupied with a few must contacts, some poor programs, and a week in Kuldabad where he spent the nights in seclusion in various tombs and shrines. From Satara again, Baba dictated his decision regarding his final declaration, which was issued as a circular on Sunday, the 10th of April, 1955. This universe has come out of God. God has not come out of the universe. Illusion has come out of reality. Reality has not come out of illusion. God alone is real. The universe by itself is illusion. God can and has become man and lives on earth as God and man. He is the God-man, the avatar, Christ, or Razul. God's life lived in illusion as the avatar and the perfect masters is not illusory, whereas God's life lived in creation as all animate and inanimate beings is both real and illusory. Illusion, illusory life, and God's life in illusion are not and cannot be one and the same. Illusion has no life and can have no life. Illusion is illusion and is nothing by itself. Illusory life means life in illusion, and though it is life, as experienced by the soul in creation, 
it is illusory life. But God's life lived in illusion is not illusory because in spite of living the illusory life, God remains conscious of his own reality. God is absolutely independent, and the universe is entirely dependent upon God. Yet when the perfect masters effect the descent of God on earth as the avatar, they make reality and illusion interdependent each upon the other. And thus it is that his infinite mercy and unbounded love are eternally drawn upon by those who are immersed in illusion. Between God and the universe, infinite mercy and unbounded love act as a prominent link which is eternally made use of by men who become God and by God who becomes man. And so the universe becomes the eternal playmate of God. Through this prominent link, the avatar not only established life in his divine play, but also established law and illusion. And this law being established by the God-man or avatar is the law of the lawless infinite, and it is eternally real and at the same time illusory. It is this law that governs the universe. All its ups and downs, construction and devastation are guided by this law. At this cyclic period, God's independent absoluteness is made to work upon this law by the God-man as God's will. This means that anything and everything that the avatar wills is ordained by God. Consequently, all that I stated in the final declaration and confirmation is ordained by God and must and will happen. I was in Kuldabad for nearly a week from the 22nd of March. There, night and day, I did my work most intensively. The intensity of my spiritual work caused great pressure on my physical body and mind. And it was there that I decided that all that I had declared in my final declaration must come to pass exactly in the same sequence and with the same intensity of effect, but with modification in the time factor. Therefore, with change in the time limit, the intensity, scope, shape, and size of the chain of events will take place without any moderation whatsoever to bring into effect the destined plan. In the meantime, mankind must await, as it must according to my final decision, the witnessing of all that is to come to pass as ordained by God. This is the time when man must love God more and more. Let him live for God and let him die for God. In all his thoughts, in all his words, and in all his actions, love for God alone must prevail. Baba called for a small group meeting at the Rosewood Bungalow in Sitara on Sunday morning, the 24th of April. 36 men, including the Mondali, collectively represented all those persons closely connected with him and all those who love him and follow his instructions. Beginning the meeting, Baba had a letter read by Adi Jr. in which an American expressed his readiness to stay in India vowing to save Baba from the clutches of those who wanted to stab him to death. Smiling, Baba remarked, at least there is one person in the world to protect me. These are comments and statements made by Baba during that meeting. Those who live with me, as well as those who live for me, despite being away from me, each have individual faults and weaknesses, but they have no equals, I know. They need not necessarily know. They have been following me all these years through thick and thin. I do not mind saying that if I were in their places, I might not have been able to stand what they have stood so splendidly so far. It is also a fact that it is I who have been helping them to stick to me. The time is drawing near when they will have to maintain their hold on my daman on their own. I want none to leave me, but if one and all were now to give up, I would not mind at all. 
For those who choose to remain with me and near me, there is the possibility of greater hardships and even lack of day-to-day -day provisions after the period of my retirement. I will not at all be displeased with those who feel they have had enough of a life of obedience and who from May or August 1st choose to live a life of their own. I am now offering that freedom to one and all. If you decide to leave me, you do so honorably, and all you have done so far will continue to stand in your credit. But if having chosen to stick to me, you later give me up, you would earn the title of Mardud, which means apostate, thus wiping out all your past service and obedience to me. Those who decide to stick to me may have to suffer in the future, but one thing is certain, they will not suffer alone. I will equally share with them their hardships and privations. Now I will tell you one important thing about promises. Baba is always free to give and break promises. But in a way, he binds himself by issuing this life circular number 25, which applies individually and collectively. Now, how to explain about my promises? Baba is helpless in explaining. Why? Whatever Baba does or explains is beyond ordinary understanding. And it is not one's fault not to understand me. For how can you understand the perfect one? Some such things had happened at the times of Jesus and Muhammad. Jesus was crucified and Muhammad was stoned and had to flee Makkah. Such actions on the part of perfect ones are not understood by the people. I give promises and break them. This has been going on continually. Some Mandali members think that if I stop giving promises, I will be honored much. If some intimate ones feel like this, what would those lovers think who get my sahabas only occasionally? Yet sometimes I myself think, why should I act like this? But that is all. In spite of my declaration, clarification, confirmation, and decision, last night a thought came to me. What was the necessity of issuing the clarification, confirmation, and decision after the declaration? And I got the answer. Now try to understand. When the declaration was given out, the last three were bound to follow. The phases were implied in the declaration itself. This whole process may be likened to a full-grown mango tree. The declaration can be compared with the sprouting of the tree just above the ground, the clarification with the growing trunk and the branches, the confirmation with the blossom, and the decision with the mangoes. To give another simile, a day is made up of four parts. Day begins with the first part. The last part is followed by the previous three to complete a day. Similarly, the life of a man is divided into four main stages, such as childhood, youth, middle age or maturity, and old age. In every stage of creation, you will find these stages. If we look at the genesis of the universe, we will find the same thing. In the beginningless beginning, that is, in the beyond, beyond state, God was unconscious, infinite. The urge to know himself which God had can be compared with the declaration. Once the urge was there, it could not be stopped. Then out came creation, evolution, and involution, the next three phases. God is also infinite knowledge, so as soon as the urge, who am I, arose, he got the answer, I am God. But at the same time, the intervening stages were necessary. Through creation, the answer was clarified. Through evolution, the answer was confirmed. And involution decided that he was God. It is very difficult to explain all these things, for they lie beyond the domain of intellect. A Persian poet has said, As soon as you step on the threshold of spirituality, you need different ears to hear and different eyes to see. Tukaram has also said, the ways of the masters stand in contradiction to those of the world. 
Don't think that through all these explanations, I'm trying to justify my actions. With the exclusion of the time factor, all I have said will come to pass. For whatever I have said, God has made me say it. Listen very carefully to what I say now. For the three months, May through July 1955, do not think much about your wife, children, and money. For should you have such thoughts when the avatar may be required to drop his body? The soldiers on active service willingly sacrifice their lives just to possess a piece of ground. Would it be of any great importance if you sacrifice your life for the avatar? If you fail to have such readiness, your coming over here to attend the meeting would be nothing more than a picnic. Now, one more point. All the explanations and articles have no connection with reality. It is all a play of words and has no lasting value. Reality is beyond mind, beyond intellect. The very fact when you say that you have intellectually understood reality shows that you have misunderstood it. To have real understanding, consciousness must remain, and the intellect, the mind, must go. It does not mean becoming mad like Punjya in the Mad Ashram at Rahuri. What I mean is that intellect should be the means of wholeheartedly achieving ends that are accepted by the heart. And if you obey me with all your heart, intellect will go and consciousness will remain. A person may be very intelligent, but if he does not have the fortune to keep the company of a sadguru, he will not get self-realization. On the other hand, a person, though dull, who has that rare fortune to have the company of a perfect master can have self-realization. And I myself will bow down to such a person who is fortunate enough to be very intelligent and at the same time who has love for and the company of a perfect master. Even after coming in contact with a perfect master, it is very difficult to obey him. Suppose you believe me to be the perfect one, and while obeying me, even if you have a passing thought doubting my perfection, it would not be perfect obedience. At this point, Baba asked Erich to read out the circular titled, The Die is Cast. According to my final decision, except for the time factor, everything will happen in every detail and sequence as declared, clarified, and confirmed by me. There is now no limitation to any point in time, nor contact with any point in time. Things may happen after one month or three months, after three years or twenty years. In short, I may speak tomorrow, or my silence may be broken after ten years. I am free from all promises, bindings, undertakings, and arrangements. No one should therefore ask for anything material or spiritual from me at any time or on any account. I will do what I think to be the best for one and all and when I deem it fit. It is only on this basis that all concerned must now decide whether to give up or hold on to my daman, that is, to believe in me, revere me, and remain devoted to me by following my orders and instructions. The period of three months, from May 1st to July 31st, 1955, is a period of crisis for me. I must go into retirement for three reasons. For myself, for those who love me, and for all. During the period of my stay in Jal Villa, Satara, I will not step out of the central rooms of the bungalow. I may or may not eat and sleep regularly during the duration of the crisis. I am not bound to remain at any one place during or after the first month of my retirement. I may change my plans at any moment and might undertake to go on foot from place to place or go into even greater solitude. 
No one should under any circumstances come to see me or communicate with me directly or indirectly for any reason whatsoever up to the end of July 1955. All those closely connected with me, all those who love me, and all those who care to follow my instructions must be scrupulously honest, must strictly abstain from sexual actions, and must try to spread my message of love and truth as far and wide as possible during the period of crisis of three months. Then Baba continued dictating, Now I will explain about holding fast to my daman. Hold me or leave me. Don't try to compromise. One thing is definite and fixed. If I am the highest of the high or if I am the lowest of the low, and you hold fast to my daman, you will be where I will be. This depends on how tight your grip is on my daman. It doesn't matter if you are saints or sinners. If you hold fast to my daman, you will be wherever I will be. Now, holding fast means what? It means to keep Baba pleased always. And how to please him? By your obeying him wholeheartedly. All these years, it was I who held fast to your garment. Now the time has come that you should hold firm to mine. Sometimes I think no one from among you can do that, for I myself cannot do it. The period of three months is very critical for me. During the seclusion, I may suffer from paralysis. From the 1st of August, you can do correspondence, but I am not bound to reply. Baba then gave a list of directives for the Mandli staying with him in Sitara during the months of seclusion. Referring to his Mandali, Baba said, For those who are with me through thick and thin for the last so many years and have deep love for me, there is no group who would stand equal to my Mandali. I have humored them, chuckled them, and whatnot, but they have not left me. Everyone has his defects, but I only look to the love they have for me. This time, I want to see who remains and who goes. All these years you were with me because I had caught hold of you all. Now I am going to free you. So it is all the more necessary that you hold my daman tighter and tighter. Baba explained to his Mandali and Sitara that they were free to decide whether they wanted to live with him or live away from him. But he had asked Erich, who looked after his personal needs, that he at least should decide to remain with him. But if he really wanted to live away from him, Baba signed, I tell you now, I do not mind. After more explanations and orders to the Mandali, the meeting was concluded at 3.30 p.m. Baba had been with them continuously for almost eight hours. He did not embrace or shake hands with those who had come. He simply raised his hand in farewell with that memorable smile on his face as he left for Grafton Bungalow. The three months of seclusion to integrate this aspect of his work into the divine plan were completed, as were many more months of seclusion for his universal work over the next 15 years. For the rest of his life, Meher Baba occasionally reiterated that point from his final declaration. My manifestation as the avatar of the time will be of short duration. This short period will, in quick succession, cover my humiliation, the breaking of my silence, my glorification, and my violent physical end. Through the years, people have reacted in different ways to topical statements like this from him. The typical response is, yeah, Mayor Baba said a lot of things. And because it cannot be understood, it is ignored. For his lovers who have tried to understand something of these messages, the inevitable conclusion is that much of this is, as Baba explained, beyond the comprehension of the intellectual mind. It all has to do with his work. Time will tell. But for the sake of remembering all things Meher Baba all the time, let's take a deeper look at his manifestation. First, 
humiliation said in our language. It is hard for people to understand that God, with infinite power, could come into human form and helplessly suffer more afflictions than the average person. Meher Baba's humiliation seems to be a direct result of his perfect humility. And as he stated in his call from the same period, even real saints and sages who have some knowledge of the truth have failed to understand the avatar's greatness when faced with his real humility. Second, point number three from the clarification. The breaking of my silence and uttering the one word of words. It was said in my own language and simultaneously in yours, because when I utter that word, it will be an audible word to you. The only incident we know of when Baba uttered the mm sound, as he described it earlier, was in his room at Merazad a few days before he dropped his body. As Erich and Francis were turned away, attending to some detail, they heard Baba make a very loud mmm sound. And when they turned to look at Baba, they saw him covering his mouth with his hand. This incident corresponds with other statements Baba had made. This is from November of 1960. My silence must break. There is no escape from it. I shall not lay down my body until I have given the word to the world. Of my own, I shall not break my silence. Universal crisis will make me do so. When the crisis will reach its absolute culmination, it will make me utter the word at that moment. Third, point number four from the clarification. My glorification, it was said simultaneously in my language and yours. Baba had explained that the universal work he accomplished during his physical lifetime would take effect from the moment he dropped his body. His dropping the body represents the release of his work. All the final work for his manifestation had to be completed before he dropped his body. Fourth, my violent physical end. Point number six from the clarification, the stab in my back. It was said in my own language alone. And point number seven, the dropping of my body. It was said in my own language and simultaneously in yours. In his introductory comments about his final declaration, Baba stated, a very strange and serious disease will attack this body, which will be because of my humiliation that I have been speaking about. Indeed, a strange disease did attack his body, causing extremely high blood urea and painfully violent spasms, ultimately leading to his physical death. Now, if all this did happen as Meher Baba said it would, then why have we not seen the effect of his manifestation in the world? I believe there are two reasons for this. First, let's refer back to that all-important phrase from his final decision that Baba emphasized. All that I had declared in my final declaration must come to pass exactly in the same sequence and with the same intensity of effect, but with modification in the time factor. Out of compassion for the very world that ignores him or disdains him, Mayor Baba has extended the time element of his manifestation to assure the full measure of the great spiritual upheaval that is to come. Baba gave such great importance to the breaking of his silence. So after he dropped his body and no great change, material or spiritual seemed to occur, there were many who assumed that Mayor Baba just could not or did not do what he had promised, and they lost interest. The other reason we fail to have faith in his words is that we think this world of forms, with its framework of time and space, is reality, no matter how many times he explained to us that this gross world is the depth of illusion. But then, what would have been the view from the higher planes when Baba dropped his body? 
There was one person with that authoritative perspective who spent most of his life at Maribad, who was there when Baba dropped his body. That was Muhammad Must. And these are a few of his comments from that time. On the 30th of January, 1969, after Padri was called to stay at Marazad for a week, Muhammad told Sidhu, Padri will return tomorrow. Dada is coming here to join Gustaji, which meant abiding in the beyond state of God after life. Unlike everyone else struggling with deep grief after Baba dropped his physical body, Muhammad was in a very jubilant mood. When Padri asked him if he wanted to go up the hill to view Baba's body, he replied, Dada is here with me. Why should I want to go there? Can't you see Dada? You don't have to go there. He is here. Everywhere now. Look, he is here. He was actually pointing and repeating, Dada Ale, Dada Ale, which means Baba has come. However, on February 7th, the last day of interment, Muhammad asked to be taken to Baba Samadhi. He circumambulated a pile of earth that would be used to cover Baba's body many times and also circumambulated the tomb shrine, but did not go inside. He continued to repeat Dada Ale and was ecstatically happy as he usually was whenever Baba was with him. This photograph of him with Sidhu was taken that day on the hill. So it is obvious that when Meher Baba dropped his physical body, there was an immediate experience of manifestation in the mental world, at least for those who knew of him. Most likely there are different, lesser degrees of experience in the subtle world also. And he has assured us that there will be a great spiritual awakening for humanity at large in the gross world. But only after this period of cathartic disintegration of false values and beliefs. The preordained destruction of multiple separateness. The apex of that suffering will be the tipping point that results in the release of the tide of infinite spiritual wisdom. That is his promise. Some of the Mandali have commented about Baba's manifestation. By his order, Bao Kalchuri and Francis Brabazon have written beautifully about the subject. Meher Baba breaking his silence, speaking the word of words, and manifesting is a long topic for another time. I would like to thank Meher Nazar Publications and MSI for the photographic images and that ocean of information, Lord Meher. J. Meher Baba.